I think we have quite a fair amount of people in and it's uh, half past two, so let's get started. So a very good afternoon to everyone and welcome to Asian Schools of uh, Business webinar series, the day after tomorrow, COVID-19. I am Rhoda Yap, the Chief Operating Officer of the Asia School of Business and the moderator for today's session, Flatten the Curve, Then What? This is the seventh session in the series, and I'm delighted to have with me today two panelists. First, uh, Gilbert Conkey, uh, who's the Chief Risk Officer at Maybank, and Anella Monroe, Professor of Economics at the Asia School of Business Master for Central Banking Program. So before we dive in, a few housekeeping uh, rules that I would like to share. Uh, there is a Q&A box uh, that is separate from the chat box where I will encourage you to put your questions in and keep an eye on it. If there, are, there is a question that you specifically want answered or resonates with you, please upvote it. And at the end of the session, uh, the, the panelist session, we will get to those questions uh, time permitting. So with that, allow me to start um, our session with Gilbert. So Gilbert, how have things been for Maybank since COVID-19? Well, first, uh, let me uh, say thank you for uh, inviting me to, to speak today. I think it's a, it's a real honor to, uh, to have the opportunity to participate here. Um, for uh, Maybank, I, I have to say, and I think uh, probably quite true with every financial institution globally, uh, it's been um, it's been quite a, a, an interesting time, and that's the the old uh, I call it the Chinese proverb curse, if I can. Um, you know, we've uh, we're going through what I would say is the, the trivector of uh, adverse economic uh, events. Uh, you know, COVID uh, obviously having a significant impact on business continuity, uh, as well as impacting on the financial system, and then having to deal with. Uh, I call it uh, markets in turmoil, uh, just as we did in 2008, 2009, uh, and then compounding that with uh, all kinds of other things, the oil price crisis, and so it's been it's been a, it's been a very interesting uh, time to say the least. Uh, been quite good uh, in other ways. Um, you know, one thing that uh, all things that come out of a crisis, uh, teams normally pull together quite well, and so I've been quite pleased uh, by the response. Uh, not only internal to Maybank, but also into the broader financial industry, uh, working with the uh, the governments uh, across the region uh, in addressing you know what is arguably one of the most uh, serious uh, you know economic events that have hit us in well, some would say in a hundred years. Um, certainly, the the closest we we would come to is probably the Asia financial crisis. So given that banking is one of the essential services and operated during this movement control order, could you kindly share some of those experiences, especially in keeping the employees safe whilst you operating business? Uh, were there any measures taken during the time? Thank you, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, we have a, a rather large footprint that uh, covers from uh, we have uh, you know four branches in uh, in China, Hong Kong, uh, all the way through London, New York. Um, obviously, uh, one of our, our uh, branches is in uh, Kunming, which is very close to uh, Wuhan um, and Shanghai. And so uh, we started uh, looking at this issue going back into um, you know mid early mid uh, January, and I think from then it uh, it was a, a process for us. Uh, to, to again set the right priorities, and uh, obviously the the most important. If you truly believe that your employees are your most valuable asset, uh, and that your customers truly uh, matter to you, um, that was the the stance we took. And again, looking at safeguarding uh, both, uh, you know whether it is um, you know making sure that they have masks, sanitizers, uh, split operations. Um, you know, what is the uh, minimum viable operation that we could uh, operate? And clearly we had some very good lessons starting in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in, in China and then cascading to Hong Kong. Uh, and as it expanded into uh, Singapore and Malaysia, I, again, for us, it was a, a, a matter of, um, you know, as the threat levels increased 
um, in each of the various countries uh, and locations we operated uh, to make sure that we responded uh, accordingly, um, reducing the size of our footprint, the number of uh, employees that were working uh, from office, um, and then moving you know, more and more individuals working from home. Obviously, to do that meant that we had to change um, you know, the way we met, uh, we operated, which meant uh, increasing you know, the uh, technology applications. So for, for us, it was, a, it was a continuous process of, uh, of iteration, uh, learning, uh, taking you know, the, uh, the, um, the various experiences that, that uh, other countries and other uh, you know, officials uh, went through and applying you know, those that we thought most appropriate to our organization. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a big experience of communication. Uh, you can make the right decisions, you can have the right plan, but if we aren't you know, prepared to communicate well, and get that understanding across, not only to uh, our staff, but uh, more importantly to uh, all the other stakeholders that uh, we represent uh, or that are dependent on us uh, for the, uh, the soundness of the financial system. And again, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional um, you know, a, a plan that we had to execute. Well, thank you for that. I think it's very heartening to hear that how uh, the focus is basically one that is based from a people perspective. I think there are a lot of people out there today that have that type of anxiety as to are the big corporations looking after uh, the people in general. I also uh, note that the point that you were making about the ability to kind of dial up and down the responses based on the different type of scenarios is something uh, that is very key, especially as you highlighted, learning is such a key thing. And I think that that is potential, like that story and the advice is going to be helpful for many of us who are across uh, in the small, medium enterprises as well. So with that, let me pivot to Anella. Anella, you recently wrote uh, a piece uh, with um, Professor Ali Ramanola answering the million dollar question, no billion dollar question of how long will COVID-19 last? So could you share a bit about that, please? Sure. So this was sort of back at the end of March. And as you say, the, the, the question of the time was how long will COVID last? Um, and in a sense, the narrative at the time was flatten the curve and, uh, you know, we'll get to the other side around May or June and, and, and things will go a bit back to normal. So, um, and the idea of flatten the curve is um, to, to keep within the health system capacity. I don't know if you have a, a slide um, that we can put up and it, it's sort of a familiar picture to many of the the surge that would happen if we did nothing, um, and then the, the flatten the curve. Um, here, the, the blue is the surge that would happen if we did nothing, and then the red is the flatten the curve, we stay at home, and then we come out the other side. So our idea was, well, how long is that flat curve? If we were to run along at the health system capacity, how, how long is it? And um, so our, our first answer was, uh, you know, if you account for about 5% of people getting a critical case and the number of critical care beds and how fast you can get them through, then our first answer was sort of on the order of 10 years. And we thought four, 10 years. Um, but then we thought, no, it's probably not so bad because not everybody gets it because probably only 60 to 75% of people are going to get this. So that, that took it, you know, below uh, 10 years maybe. And then we thought, yeah, even then there was a lot of talk about people who have the disease and have no symptoms that aren't being measured. So maybe the critical rate was lower. So even, even back then, based on Chinese data, people were saying, you know, maybe for every one that we measure, there's another one out there. So and took it maybe back to two to four years. But even then, um, you know, that's a back of the envelope calculation. It's very uncertain. But the answer was, this is not months, this is years, right? So we really need to, to plan for the long haul. And when we think of the timeline, you, you can sort of think of the blue in the picture as that's the timeline of the virus. That's the kind of exponential growth um, that we were all talking about um, back then. And our long flat curve, in a sense, is the timeline of the health system capacity. Um, but you know, in that, in that long flat curve, a lot of people die and maybe those people don't need to die. So then we said, actually, 
we can we can set our own timeline by how much we mitigate this. So at least we think we should be able to. Um, and with the blue curve, there's this notion of uh, I'm, I'm, it's on the television all the time. This idea of the replication number R or R not, and uh, R R not is sort of the uncontrolled spread before you take any mitigation, and that's. Uh, for this virus, it's not as infectious as measles, but it's, uh, it, 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 it's you, on average, people spread it to one and a half to four people, maybe even five or six. Um, but we can change the effective replication number. On average, how many people, if I get it, do I spread it to? Um, and what really matters is if R is bigger than one, we're back into that powerful mean exponential growth. Um, and if R is less than one, then the virus should die away. So really it comes down to how much can we mitigate this? Can we get R, R, bless, R below one? Um, and personally, I'm, I'm very hopeful. I think, you know, you, you, you think back to March when there weren't enough masks. Masks were for people on the front line of the health system. You couldn't buy hand sanitizer in the shop. We were doing several hundred tests a day uh, in Malaysia. Now we're doing something like 20 times that. You can buy masks for cheaply in the pharmacy and hand sanitizer, it's fine. And the testing capacity, even though there's still a global shortage, it's going up fast, right? So the, the idea was this could last a long time. Plan for the worst uh, and hope for the best, right? The best, the worst is the long haul. <laughs> it's years, not months, and the best is probably a vaccine or a good treatment. So that, that's what our uh, story was about. Yeah. Thanks, Anella. I think one of the points that you were mentioning, um, you know, keeping the replication rate down, those are, and, and the usage of masks, that has really evolved in the last uh, few weeks, you know, to show how fluid the situations are. I remember initially when there was a recommendation of usage of masks, we just know that that was not something that we could operationalize because there was a pure shortage. But fast forward like eight weeks, 10 weeks, and then we, we are here now where that is not as acute as a shortage as it was, say, 10 weeks ago. So thanks for that reminder, Anella. And I guess even though, you know, R is less than one is a bit of a numbers geeky thing, economists like numbers, it, it's also a very clear goal that we're all working towards the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Anella. So Gilbert, given that Anella says that, you know, it's a two to four year horizon, but uh, now we are technically in day 57 of the, um, since the movement control order was put in, or day two of the CMCO, would you be able to share some of the learning that Maybank is starting, or maybe even making as a permanent practice, like in Malaysia, and perhaps even regionally as well? Okay, maybe, maybe I'll just start, uh, I spoke a lot about, uh, I called some of the things that uh, we are doing within, um, Maybank. People just take a, a few minutes just to kind of go into, well, um, once we went into this, and I think as Anella's pointed out, it was always very uncertain. Again, we're, we're uh, financial uh, people by, by training, and our stress testing typically is quite financial. Uh, what we didn't have are a lot of uh, epidemiologists, uh, and how, did, how would this factor into the economy? Uh, but it was very, very clear it was going to have a very significant human impact. And so a lot of what we uh, did uh, early on and we continue to do now uh, through, you know, the, the, what, there's a moratorium in place and a number of uh, initiatives that have been put in place. But a lot of that was to look at, well, how, how do we then structure for a recovery? Um, and so if you think about the, the work, the engagement that uh, uh, a number of the f uh, financial institutions had with the, uh, the government in particular, uh, with Bank Nagara, was, well, how do we ensure that uh, those that would be most uh, hard hit, uh, SMEs and consumers, and again, consumers through, you know, making sure that the SMEs survive to continue to uh, provide good jobs, which then again keeps the economy moving. So a lot of our work has been focused um, both on a business continuity perspective as well as how, how do we help uh, in one of our primary responsibilities, which is keeping a sound financial system uh, where uh, credit 
um, and uh, services, um, moving payments and other things, uh, continues to operate. And I, so a lot of work uh, can use, continues to be done in that area. Um, from, a, from a day 57 perspective, uh, we have kind of gone through what I, what I would say is the, the worst part about how could this go, uh, how do we bring down uh, our footprints, you know, more people working from home, very much aligned to the MCO um, expectations uh, to, as Anella says, to flatten the curve. The next part is anticipating, well, once, once things start to end, once we come out of an MCO, once the economy uh, starts to move, how do we assist getting businesses back um, up and running? So from my perspective, uh, there's a lot of focus on that. Uh, we're very, very mindful that this could lead into uh, what is often called the second wave. And I think, again, if you looked at the, the chart that uh, Anella just placed up, uh, if you flatten the curve and you bring it down below one, uh, which is, as an example, what Germany uh, was able to do, then they opened up and we found that the curve went back up over one. And so then you start to bring in uh, this, this the specter of, of a second wave, uh, which could have even a more serious impact than the first economic part. So it's always, again, getting this balance. From our perspective, we recognize we need to get, um, you know, get the businesses to a, a sound footing and work with them to do that, um, and, but also in a safe way. So a lot of the lessons learned that we have, again, by, by having a, um, a stage, we use the, uh, roughly the, the WHO, the, um, uh, the health organization, World Health Organization's uh, staging, you know, looking at a watch list, uh, you know, uh, Amber Alert, and um, going into, you know, a disaster mode. And then how do we want to scale up, making sure that we can uh, continue to operate uh, in a very sound way for ourselves to provide the services that are required in a way that doesn't have people come out uh, necessarily to uh, either the bank. Um, on the other side, then it's also recognizing that uh, this means there will be uh, cash flow issues uh, for a number of our, uh, our customers. And so uh, a lot of the work that we're doing now is this preparation uh, which customers are likely to have cash flow issues? Is this going to be a temporary thing just through the MCO? And it will uh, alleviate itself once we're through the MCO. Is there going to be a longer period? And clearly there are certain industries, uh, often you know, uh, noted uh, the uh, airlines as an example, um, you know, the cruise ships, uh, hotels, uh, which will be more dramatically impacted. So how do we work with these uh, customers to get them through uh, the next period. And some will be longer and some uh, arguably will be much shorter. But the whole idea now is to uh, start to focus forward. So uh, again, the planning that we put in place, you know, to, to scale down as the, as the crisis built and then looking, using that as a guide for how we want to bring you know, both our organization and services to our customers uh, as their needs and demands uh, increase over time is really the, the primary uh, focus, um, you know, that we've set in place now. And so a lot of work that we're doing, um, you know, banks are, are big on uh, data analytics. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is to, you know, use our analytics, uh, understand what our customers are doing and where those changes are. Uh, clearly, we're reaching out to our customers at the same time, uh, speaking to them, what are their needs? Uh, when do they think uh, they might uh, start to become much more active? Uh, and then how do we then work with them uh, in a much more uh, constructive way um, you know, to bring their businesses back uh, you know, um, and facilitate you know, the, some of the I call it gumminess that is likely to exist in the, the economy? Uh, in terms of uh, permanent practices, you know, some of the things that uh, we have done uh, when we went to what we call live split operations, uh, we recognize that, uh, you know, dispersing our staff out of, you know, large uh, singular build, uh, buildings into multiple buildings, the use of technology uh, and engaging, you know, with our uh, customers in new ways, um, or well, maybe not new ways, but more uh, more in-depth ways, uh, such as you know, using you know chats, using um, 
uh, you know, what's up, what using, um, you know, other f forms of communication, call centers. Uh, so not spending as much time Zoom, uh, I think is a great way that we've been reaching out to many of our customers. Uh, and again, just keeping a, uh, um, you know, a, a pulse of uh, what is happening and what their needs are, and then how can we respond in a timely basis as they go forward. Um, the, you know, I think the best thing we can say is, and I think NL set it up early, is you, you plan for the, the worst and then uh, do everything you can to mitigate and to operate to get to the best. Uh, there are many, uh, many things that we've uh, worked on. Um, and perhaps if we have a time during the question and answer, we can go through a few more of those. But I think that's really, from my perspective, how we've tried to, to move things and keep things moving. Thanks, Gilbert. I think it is a very uh, sober re reminder of like um, the potential consequences of reopening without the appropriate type of uh, kind of caution um, that could actually set the businesses and the economy back. So I think that's a good way to kind of uh, keep uh, the back of our head. And, and with that, I think I'm going to ask Anella, um, you know, what do you feel is the three levels of defense as against this uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic that we're looking at? And uh, how can we put this into practice? Uh, specifically, can, how can we modify our behaviors to manage the risk? So um, this idea of three levels of defense was something that came out of a discussion we had about who, who's responsible for this. Um, you, you hear some narratives saying, just get the testing and tracing and then we can open it all up and go back to normal. Um, and so the idea is a bit of a spin on a widely used model of risk management called three lines of defense. Um, the first line is the people who own and manage the risk. The second are people who specialize in risk. They sort of oversee and analyze and improve systems. That's Gilbert. He's the uh, chief risk officer. Um, and then the third uh, line of defense in risk management is, is independent assurance, which is usually uh, internal audit. Um, and so we said, well, we, maybe we can think of managing COVID risk in a similar way. Uh, let's call it three levels of risk so we don't take this analogy too far, right? So the, the first level of risk might be individuals. It's people who catch the disease. It's people who get sick. Um, so we kind of own and manage the risk. Um, and then firms play, as you just heard from Gilbert, obviously a really important part in, in overseeing that risk, making it easy for people to make good decisions, putting good systems in place uh, and that sort of thing. And then really we need the government to tell us how we're doing because so many people get this disease and don't show symptoms that really that testing and, and tracking and, and, and uh, monitoring is really important. I think government plays a really important, um, and so there's obviously the public health function of the government. Um, there's a huge macroeconomic support role of the government. But uh, economists love to talk about externalities. So externalities are, if, if I do something, it has costs on you. That's an externality. I impose costs on you. So um, I think government has a place uh, to, a role to play there. And one example would be travel. If I want to go and travel for personal reasons to somewhere with a high COVID risk um, and then come back, I could impose really large costs on the community here. So the government has a role to play in, in mitigating that. Um, I think on the positive side, you can also have positive externalities. If I wear a mask to protect you, uh, that's a positive externality. And so the government can play a role in, in setting some overall rules that people might not take into account the effects of their actions otherwise. Um, so it's not just about testing and tracing. It's about really the effectiveness of everybody working together, these three uh, levels of defense, uh, if you want to call them. Um, and, you know, if risk management's really good at the first level, if we all really make sensible decisions, makes it awfully easy for the next level and the next level along. Um, how do we work together? I would say one really important thing is communication, transparency, and listening. Um, if, if people are clear about what they're doing and the goal, and, and goals come from various levels, um, I think... R is well below one is, is an easy common goal. Um, 
it, it makes it easier. If, if, if you're sick, don't come to work. If, if somebody in your household has a symptom, please don't come to work and let me make it easy for you. Let me pay your wages until the testing comes through and let me pay your wages and give you coverage until you're healthy to come back, right? Um, and also I think people really, I'm always amazed at innovative solutions that people come up with, right? If, if people know the goal and they know what they're trying to do and you, you listen to them, that they come up with the most amazing ways to mitigate things and to find a new normal that can even be fun, it can even be better than it was before. Um, one thing I just loved was a video on the, online, I'm a bit of a coffee addict and people receiving their coffee with social distances in electric train or a flying fox. And, you know, they, they, we can have fun with this at the same time. But uh, yeah, decision-making during a crisis is hard at the best of times. So a clear goal, some structures to help us think about our roles in it just makes it a bit easier. So that was, uh, that was the idea about that three levels of defense. Thanks, Anella. I think there are a couple of things that you mentioned there that kind of resonated perhaps with quite a lot of uh, people in terms of like, you know, think about, make things easy for, so that people can embrace the new norm and like make sure their wages are paid uh, along those lines so they don't have to feel that they have to basically put their lives online to ensure that the basic needs are, are met. So, um, so with that, uh, Gilbert, now, now that we have like set the stage, <laughs> going forward, do you see fundamental changes in how businesses operate when it comes to risk relating to COVID-19? I would, I would I would like to think yes, um, and, and certainly the uh, the best way to to look at this is that uh, this is actually uh, again likely the worst pandemic that has hit since 1918, um, and so I think it's it, it will be something that will stay in people's minds. We had SARS uh, back in 2003. We had H1N1 uh, in 2009. Um, and again, whilst people uh, recognize that and uh, organizations took measures, uh, the absolute severity of this one uh, and the uh, recognition that, uh, you know, how we want to run our organizations need to perhaps be uh, de-risked to a greater extent than we have in the past. Maybe not have as much leverage, maybe uh, think about our employees, think about uh, how you might do things uh, embracing uh, technology uh, and other uh, ways to be able to do things. Uh, a lot, uh, there are a lot of things we can do. Um, when I think about uh, um, SME businesses, uh, I also recognize that, uh, you know, um, and this is, this is something we talk about in the, in the bank uh, quite regularly. You know, the SME uh, owner is often, you know, spending all his time in the car driving around looking for business. Um, and so we're going to have to say, well, is there going to be something that we can do differently to help facilitate that? There's a, you know, the, the, uh, the applications of fintech and other ways to engage uh, businesses. Um, you know, if we look at uh, Lazada, Alibaba, and how people can sell through different ways, there likely are, um, I'll call it new ways to do business that maybe weren't as um, widely embraced. Will there be changes? Uh, undoubtedly, yes. Some business models, I think, um, as you go forward, will have to be adjusted. Um, I would like to, as I said, I'd like to think that, um, that uh, we will do things differently from, a, from an organizational continuity. I can say the, the banks uh, clearly will, uh, given, you know, again, our responsibility for the soundness of the financial system. Um, and I think we will be doing things uh, differently to help our customers um, you know, engage uh, with other customers uh, going forward. I think that will be perhaps one of the, the big takeaways is how can we, uh, I don't want to overuse a, a phrase called the ecosystem, but how, how, do we, how do we help create a better ecosystem for all of us to work in uh, as we go forward? Um, so again, yes, I think there will be differences. I think we will, we will all adjust. Uh, we are already going through a very dramatic um, change with uh, technology. Uh, and I think that, uh, again, some of this will continue on. Um, Maybank, and again, I don't want to be 
waving a flag here, but you know, our, our, our moniker is, you know, humanizing financial services. And I think, you know, a, a big part of what financial services will have to do is change their business model. Uh, and I think our customers uh, likewise uh, see the, the imperative to do that uh, coming out of this. Uh, for us, um, you know, coming up with better uh, playbooks, uh, I think is going to be uh, an absolute uh, necessity, not just for pandemics, but for a broader range of threats. I think how we look at things like stress testing um, and the skill sets that we're going to need within the organization. As I said earlier, we don't have uh, epidemiologists, we don't have agricult uh, agricultural specialists. So there are a number of you know, skill sets we're likely going to have to start to invest in to do our business differently, uh, smarter, not harder, as we go forward. Thanks for that, Gilbert. I think like one of the things that when you, as you speak about how businesses have to potentially adapt, uh, I think those are things that uh, key things that people should keep in mind, things about like their people, you know, how the, the disease could potentially spread. But now let us turn over back to Anella and talk about from a point of view of organizations and individuals. In simple terms, um, Anella, what steps would you suggest that organizations and individuals do to keep the curve flattened in the new norm of living in COVID-19? Um, I have to say, since I've never run a business, um, when you ask about the organizational side, I'm gonna answer that question from an employee's perspective and then from an economist's, from an economist's perspective. So from, from an employee's perspective, I think, um, you know, over communicate is, is one. It's so much easier to follow leaders who say what they want. Have a clear goal, people will rally around you and push the ship in the right direction when they know the destination. Um, and as I said before, listen. I think um, sometimes there's a sense that the first things we're gonna do are the least risk ones, right? As we come out of this. But I'm not sure that we should think of it that way. I think we should think different activities have different risks. And the more risky, the more mitigation you need. And then there, then it kind of takes us back to that more familiar world of trade-offs of costs and value and that sort of thing, which is a more comfortable space. Um, and I think, especially when we can do quick turnaround, cheap testing, that really um, a lot of things become much more possible. Um, but let me, let me turn to an economist's perspective. Um, I think in coming out of this, Something that, that strikes me about this, and I think is under under underreported and underspoken about, is that really it's it's a risk sharing aspect. Nobody should expect to come out of this hole. Um, and I think, like many crises that we've had, the, which we would often describe as aggregate risk or system risk, um, it affects all of us, but none of us caused it. Um, that it tends to disproportionately fall on people really least able to bear it. Um, and that's a problem, they have no control over it. And I'm talking about those with fragile jobs, the gig economy, who have less, less access to healthcare. In Malaysia, we have public healthcare, so that's, uh, that's positive. Um, who don't have access to social welfare, um, who are in frontline jobs and exposed to the kind of health risks um, that we're all staying home to avoid. Um, and in these kind of times of aggregate risk, really we know that it, it should be people who have their jobs and people with stronger balance sheets who disproportionately do bear the risk, but it doesn't tend to work like that. Um, in part, it's the contracts rewrite, the debt contracts, the employment contracts, the rental contracts. Um, but really we need to think about a better way of, of sharing risk. And this idea is definitely not new. It's uh, goes back to at least to ancient Mesopotamia. The Code of Hammurabi said that in the event of drought, debts were not to be paid. It was emphasized by Mian and Sufi after the last crisis, although I think not a lot really has, has changed. Um, some things, um, but possibly not enough. This risk sharing idea, it's obviously central to Islamic finance. Um, but I guess my message is, 
we can't fix the system today and overnight, but for those of us who still have our jobs or have strong enough balance sheets to bear the risk and have been fortunate to come out close to whole, um, be generous. You know, there are lots of things to support out there. There are lots of people who need support. And um, yeah, so I think that the risk sharing is something we should continue to talk about uh, for some time. Um, it's something I think somebody made a comment on the Q&A uh, about the importance of having a fair uh, social support system um, in place. Um, but Rona, let me turn the question on the questioner. <laughs> You're the uh, uh, Chief Operating Officer of Asia School of Business. Do you want to say anything about what we do need to do to mitigate and keep the curve flat and, and yeah. Yeah. Well, you've been in the thick of it. I know you have. I don't think you've probably had a day off since uh, this all started. Oh. Well, it's, uh, it's good to be busy in this period. That's how I always uh, think about it. I think, uh, like as Gilbert mentioned, there are a lot of things to be very heartened and encouraged by. I think uh, Anella talking about clear communication, that is quite key and being empathetic to everyone in the team is also quite key. So one of the early things that uh, we actually realized that not everyone is going to be as productive as an engaged because if they were more used to doing work that require physical presence, they will have quite some buffer time. But I thought it was actually important to keep these uh, kind of uh, segments of our workforce engaged. And we actually actively advocated that if they have buffer time, you know, get on our online training system and get trained, right? And um, ideally acquire a new skill. Um, I didn't expect under new skills to include baking, but it appears from people's Facebook feeds, uh, that's what some people has acquired. Uh, but that aside, um, I do think that um, ensuring the mindset to say build so that when in time for recovery, we'll be able to reap what we sow. But separately, I think um, what actually really was a very inspiring thing to watch was um, our MBA students. So um, some of you may know that um, ASB moved into a new residence building for students, some 300,000 square feet in January. So less than 10 weeks into it, before the paint was entirely dry, we have to come up with um, business continuity planning for a situation of a COVID lockdown. So what we had then was, I think, truly a privilege for me to witness a group of these 30 students from all over the world, maybe they couldn't go back because of border closures, come together, organize themselves in teams of, um, you know, emergency, food, utilities, health, and come up with that business continuing planning. In like less than 72 hours, they were working like relay style, you know. I felt that uh, that was a true testament to the uh, MBA action learning curriculum. And I, I think like, had they not been so like innovative and to be able to step out and say, we're going to do this, even though we haven't done this before and really see it to fruition for me, that was a, a highlight of um, yeah, my last 10 weeks or so. Yeah. <laughs> so. And also they were out doing things in the community, PPE and so on. Yes. Is, yes. Yeah. So they had uh, idle time on their hands uh, and then they built them um, some PPE for people too. So that was pretty, um, you know, heartening to see. But Nella, I also wanted to kind of comment on your um, remark earlier that this concept of risk sharing is actually something not new and going all the way back to the Hammurabi code. I think it's such a heartening reminder, like we keep on facing the same things and we are not entirely learning from history. So hopefully this time around, uh, one can be optimistic that um, perhaps things would move in a better direction. So, and with that, we've actually come to the end of the questions part, uh, the panelists uh, part. So let us now take a look at our Q&A. So panelists, if you can uh, take a look at it as well and see if there are any questions uh, specifically that, um, you know, catches your interest. Uh, we can also take a look at what was upvoted. So the, 
Go on, Emma. Yeah, the one at the top. <laughs> Everybody wants to know what's the likelihood of a recession in Malaysia and the world. Um, how long will the recession last? I think it's quite likely we're in a global recession now. The IMF forecasts a three percent uh, fall in global GDP this year. Um, for a lot of countries, so what's a recession? A recession is two quarters of negative uh, growth in the in the economy. So a number of countries have had one negative quarter. China did in the first quarter. Obviously, they were heavily affected. A few European countries had negative growth in the first quarter. Um, will that carry through to the second quarter in some of those countries? Probably yes. In others, they'll recover. When you look at Chinese indicators of things like traffic and uh, uh, I think electricity, some of the others that they really fell a lot, but they've a lot of them have actually come back towards normal. So um, I'm quite hopeful about a, a recovery um, afterwards. For Malaysia, I think uh, Malaysia's first quarter came out at plus one and a half, but that's probably two quarters of about 4% growth. And then a lot of indicators for March were about minus five, right? So that minus five will probably carry through into um, April, we start easing in May and June, whether Malaysia has a two quarters of negative growth, I think it's possibly unlikely. Second quarter, I would think almost certainly, but uh, a recession in that definition, hard to say. I think forecasts for Asia in general are, are much better than a lot of places, maybe because Asia uh, started from a higher growth path, so you need a bigger contraction to, you know, you need a bigger slowing to get you into negative growth. Previous experience with SARS, H1N1, and MERS, and so on, you put the mitigation into place more quickly. Um, maybe a cultural focus on community that makes that mitigation easier. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, the idea of a two two quarters of global recession is not unlikely. We're probably in one now, but I wouldn't want to make the call. Thanks, Anella. Gilbert, any comments on that? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm probably the, the same view. Um, you know, again, and it's a, it's a technical, uh, technical recession clearly driven by, uh, you know, the GDP or uh, basic uh, activity falling off uh, to zero because MCOs. Uh, I think to, to us, then, it's, well, how quick a recovery? Is this uh, a V-shape? Uh, I would almost certainly say a no. Uh, is this a U-shape? Um, there are a number of things that are happening. Um, if you look at how aggressive a number of the central banks have been uh, globally, uh, whether it's the U.S. Fed, um, ECB, uh, even in uh, all across uh, Asia or different parts of Asia, um, so I think uh, one of the things is, is it a U? I think uh, uh, it's possible. Uh, it would, a lot of things I think would have to line up for it to be a, a U-shape. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's, again, and this is where uh, we are spending a lot of time is to say, well, how, how can we, and I, and I think there's a question talking about how government and uh, private sector can come together. Um, I think it's, it's quite important you know, for us to look at, well, what is it that we collectively can do to uh, try to, you know, to accelerate part of this process? Uh, I don't think any one party uh, can make it happen. I think there has to be a belief that uh, coming back to what Anella was saying is that the communication from all parties has to be that we're going to work collectively uh, to, you know, to start to move the dial. Uh, we can't wait for somebody else to be the first mover. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to see, well, how can we all get engaged in this process? Um, and again, collectively, we will, we will take some pain, but uh, how can we move forward? I know that you know, within, um, within you know, Malaysia, certainly within Maybank, uh, our, our conversations are all around that. And I think that's what we really have to do. Otherwise, it could be a very long, painful one if we, if we get, you know, if we try to open up too quickly, you know, I think we, we run the risk of a second wave, which means that it's not going to be at best a U, it'll be at best an L-shaped recovery, which will be very uh, painful for a lot. Um, for, for those of us who were around for the Asia financial crisis, what we saw was, you know, a very uh, adverse impact on middle class 
uh, and the working class coming out of that in many countries. And I think all of us have to work diligently um, and see what we can do collectively to avoid you know, a repeat of, of that event where you know, basically a generation uh, lost hope. Yeah, and although I'm optimistic, I mean, I think you, you raised some important issues about sort of coming out of it the other side. And, and there are, there is sort of, you know, separation of people from firms, confirms continue, which is really your part of um, the world. Does that then feed back into banks? Uh, hopefully not. Um, and, and the whole issue of uncertainty is so important. Even if you open up, if people are uncertain, they, they're not going to go out, they're not going to spend. And so really that giving people a degree of certainty is so important. Thank you. I look at, I'm looking at the next question. That's how with a high number of votes, what would be the three key changes to consumer banking experience as a result of MCO? I think this one has your name on it, Gilbert. <laughs> uh, three, uh, three key changes. Let me, let me think that one through. I mean, uh, we've already seen a, a number of things. Um, you know, people uh, are doing a, a lot more uh, online. That's what I was alluding to uh, earlier. Um, you know, whether it's uh, e-commerce, whether it is, um, you know, uh, purchasing meals, um, you know, from restaurants to help support local restaurants. Uh, so it's, it's, again, how do we, how do you continue to, to move that? But I think that will be one element. I think people may not travel as much. Um, so doing things online, doing things more local, I think is going to be a reality for, for, I would say, you know, one to two years. Um, I think in terms of uh, how people look at their homes, um, you know, probably will, will change as well. I think so people will start to, I think arguably there'll be um, greater desire to save up money, um, you know, or to work at, you know, um, getting, you know, the incomes, to be able to you know move beyond um, I call it uh, working from paycheck to paycheck type of uh, an existence. Um, so this this likely will have changed the, how people start to think about their future and maybe not live as much in the the moment. Uh, that's b both good and bad for the economy. So going back to what Anella and what I was trying to get at earlier, we we, we do want people to go out and spend money. Um, but uh, again, we also recognize that people are going to adjust uh, as a consequence of what they've just gone through. We saw this in 2008, 2009. We saw this clearly during the Asian financial crisis. Uh, but uh, increase towards uh, more digital uh, economies away from sort of the bricks and mortar going out to uh, do services, I think that is just a, a likely outcome. Um, it was already underway, and I think this will likely accelerate uh, a lot of that. For banks, uh, I think it, we still recognize that uh, people want a human touch. So you cannot just make things digital and impersonal. So it's how do you overlay the human touch into, uh, I'll call it the future service channels that are being uh, created. And I think that's where a lot of time and effort will be spent. Thanks, Gilbert. Anola, do you have any comments to add? So am I going to have Zoom calls with my banker and like I can have Zoom calls with my doctor now? I, I think that's that's going to be a, a reality. If that's the, if that's the um, I call it the, the, the channel or the approach you would like as the customer, I think, yes, it will be very likely. I think uh, we're doing a lot to uh, onboard electronically. The government is working on uh, new identity, um, you know, program identity card programs. Again, that will facilitate much more of that. So yes, I think uh, people will have the opportunity to not have to drive, find parking, all those other nice things and inconvenient things, uh, and still have a very close relationship uh, with the uh, financial advisor uh, or their banker. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, is there any question on the list that either uh, Gilbert or Anala that you would like to um, address? If not, I'll, I can pick one. 
Uh, why don't you go? Pick, why don't you go pick one? And they're all they're all quite good. <laughs> all right. Why why don't I pick the one that uh, and maybe reword it a little? Uh, Gilbert, what's the biggest risk you see that you're preparing for? And then I think all three of us can probably give a view at that as a point of uh, wrap up. I think, uh, again, the, the main one that we're working on um, is uh, how to engage with our customers to um, you know, get back to a, a return to, to normal, if you want to call it that. Uh, that is the, the biggest challenge that is before uh, us and our customers. Uh, and that's the one that we want to uh, really commit ourselves to addressing, you know, not just to the end of the MCO, but uh, for the 18 months that follow. Thanks, Gilbert. Anella? Um, well, I think the biggest risks uh, for me, I mean, I think we've, we've learned to teach online and that's fast, but I, I don't think, I was heartened by a survey I, I read yesterday that said really the outcomes of students learning online and offline, same course, really they do come out learning better mm -hmm. in person, that personal touch. Um, really makes a difference, which to some extent tells you that you can uh, um, you can focus more on giving the personal touch online. Uh, but also, I mean, the biggest thing I'm thinking about is how can we get students back on campus, um, which is a tough one because it involves travel, but I think there, uh, there are solutions coming with travel. We can test, we can quarantine. Um, going forward, there may be, you know, the quicker turnaround, cheaper tests. There may be, I'd personally happily wear a prison bracelet to be able to go and self-isolate um, uh, instead of quarantine. And uh, it's, it affects the travel thing is important for me because my children are in, a, in another country as well. But also the how do you manage um, gatherings of especially relatively young, healthy people who don't show symptoms? Um, and really, I think that ramping up of testing um, and that testing becoming easier um, has, has got to be a key part of, of what we do. I mean, I, yeah, I, sh I shouldn't be saying this because you're, <laughs> you're, you're doing that sort of planning, but that, that's what I think about is how are we going to get back to where we want to be. Yeah, I think one of the things just like reflecting on the conversation so far, I think there's a natural tension between health and economics. I think that, uh, you know, at every segment, there is a different type of scale up and scale down using the terms Gilbert used uh, earlier on. That's actually quite key. And uh, this is the part that when we reopen, if we treat everyone as the same, one homogenous population, it is actually not going to be optimal. And I feel like that is where potentially uh, the risk from my point of view is something that hopefully we can address um, you know, as a collective, as opposed to as individuals or individual organization, but working across government organizations and individuals. So um, with that, um, do you have any final kind of uh, comments before we wrap this up? I'll start with Vanilla and then I'll uh, end with Gilbert. Ah, gosh, I don't know, just, um, yeah, be generous, look out for people who didn't make it so well through, uh, support the economy. Cooking's great, I'm glad people have improved cooking, I'm a bit over it buy your favorite food online, you're supporting not only the business, which is good because your favorite curry will still be there in a month, but um, <laughs> you're supporting the cook, you're supporting the cleaners, the other restaurant staff, the delivery person. Um, so yeah, we, we need to go out and, and buy things safely and support the economy. Thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd have to share that, uh, that sentiment as well. I mean, uh, first of all, you know, stay safe. Um, you know, uh, this has been a great time to spend with your uh, with your your loved ones. Hopefully, anyways. Um, and you know, then I think it is exactly what uh, Anel says. It's uh, you know, look after your your neighbors, your community. Um, you know, that's what uh, differentiates us in a, in a civilization. And uh, I think we all have a role to play to to uh, get through to the other side, and we will. And I, I'm a firm believer that. Uh, you know, we will pass through this. It will have pain and we'll have uh, some uh, adverse outcomes. 
but we will get through and um, hopefully we get through together uh, and uh, not in a, uh, I'll call it a, in a negative fashion. So that the, you know, my, my expectation, a lot of people pulling together, I've, I've seen the best of a lot of people um, in uh, working together, you know, to, to uh, serve, you know, the organization, but also, and most importantly, the, the communities and the customers. Yeah, I would second that. I think the, uh, of the things we, we know, some things will keep going afterwards, working from home, flexibility, digital, all of that, but really that whole community spirit that we've seen again and again is fantastic. And let's keep that. I think it was always there, and it's broadened and shone through, which is great. Yeah. So thank you, a very big thank you to both of you um, for your time, Gilbert, for your time, Anola, and for ending this on such an optimistic and hopeful note. Uh, for those of you who are still who have joined today, I have a request. Uh, can you please uh, give the feedback uh, per what you see uh, on screen? We would like to know what you enjoyed. Uh, what would you like to see more of? And for future topics, is there anything that you would like to hear from us? And uh, our next uh, webinar, stay tuned. We will have something coming up and we will be sending you details soon. So with that, um, you know, stay safe, everyone, and see you at the next one. Goodbye. <laughs>